peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you from the studios of the islamic broadcasting network here in my native island of trinidad in the caribbean with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh on uh, december the 16th uh, 2018, I conducted an all-day seminar on Dajjal uh, in the British city of Birmingham. We had a very large turnout, about more than 450 people attending, and uh, these are the pile of questions which would not be answered in the seminar. I promised them but I'll try to answer the question subsequently. And that's what you're going to try to do today. And then again next week in two parts. In two hours, I don't think we'll be able to complete all of these questions. But we'll try. Let me first of all share with you what was the subject matter of our seminar. Uh, we're going to repeat this seminar, inshallah, in Trinidad uh, in December of this year. Um, and you have a whole year to prepare yourself to come and attend the seminar. The seminar was uh, organized in four, four sessions. Uh, in each, second, each session, I spoke for one hour, and then we had a half an hour question and answer session. Uh, in session one, we took the subject from Jesus, the true Messiah, to Dajjal, the false Messiah, which is the subject of a book which I'm still writing now. Why did Allah Most High promise to the Israelite people that he would send them a prophet who would be known as the Messiah? Do you know the answer to that question? Who is the Messiah? Why is he known as the Messiah? This session offers Islam's unique eschatological answers which explain the advent of the Messiah his departure from this world, his subsequent return to the world in Akhirul Zaman, and it is an explanation which will surprise the Judeo-Christian world. This is what we have to offer in Islamic eschatology. What is the explanation of someone who is known as the false Messiah, Dajjal? Who is he? What is his mission? Where is he at this time? And the session ended with an explanation of the hadith of Tamim Modari. This was session number one. Uh, in session number two, we asked, how will Dajjal seek to achieve his mission of impersonating the true Messiah? Number one, his epistemological attack. You know he has one eye. And the magnificent response of Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. Number two, that the sun will rise from the West, which is modern Western civilization. And it gives us Dajjal's three stages of his mission, which is Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, and Pax Judaica. And then what is Dajjal's feminist attack and the subsequent sexual revolution. This was session number two. Session number three was devoted to Dajjal's, the prophet spoke about his mountain of bread, which is his control over money and over the economic system. This exciting session explained the link between money and the shadow mentioned in Sulatul Mursalat of the Quran a shadow which will come upon the world in three parts or three stages. And the session identified the three stages of the shadow in the context of economic and monetary history of the modern Western civilization. And it explained the child's use of money as his most formidable instrument for achieving his goal of ruling the world from Jerusalem. The session ended by warning of the grave danger of which, uh, which will emerge in the world when he, Dajjal comes with one world currency which will replace all today's paper, plastic, and electronic money and cryptocurrencies and so on. That was session number two. 
in session number three, uh, we, that was session number three, sorry. Number, question number four was an Islamic view of the end of history. And in this final session, it was devoted to describing and explaining the timeline of events which will culminate with the appearance of Dajjal, the false messiah, in person as a human being, as a Jew, a young man, etc. He will attempt to rule the world from Jerusalem while making the false claim to be the true messiah. This session explained the Malhama or Armageddon, and then after that, the, uh, that great war, then the conquest of Constantinople, and an Islamic alliance with such Christians who would be closest in love and affection to Muslims. Then the appearance of Dajjal in person, the subsequent advent of Imam al-Mahdi, and the return of the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. It described the destruction of Dajjal as well as Gog and Magog, the subsequent return of a Khilafah state, a holy state in Jerusalem, as a ruling state in the world, with Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus ruling the world from Jerusalem, and with the simultaneous restoration of a Khilafah state, or holy state in Mecca, with Imam al-Mahdi ruling the world with justice. This was a, our, sesh, our seminar in Birmingham on December, last December the 16th. And now today we take up some of the questions uh, of the seminar. Listen, I cannot answer all of these questions now, but I'll try to do how many, as many as I can. I promise them that I'll do it. So let's take the first one with the last blessed name. Will the Great War, which is coming, because NATO is lusting for war with Russia, will the Great War take place between 2022 and 2026? My answer is, the Great War can take place soon, anytime soon. How soon? I don't know, but very soon. <laughs> Number two, uh, we should prepare for that Great War because our prophet prophesied that it will take place. We would want to know what's going to happen in that Great War. What will the world look like during the Great War and what's going to happen after the Great War? You have the Quran. Will you not go to the Quran to look for the answers? Yes, there are answers concerning that Great War in Surah Al-Isra. There are answers concerning that Great War in Surah Al-Rahman of the Quran. Allah sent the Quran to people who think, when, when, when will we start to think? Next question, has Ghazwatul Hind already taken place? Ghazwatul Hind. Ghazwa is a war in which Nabi Muhammad participated. This is our understanding of the use of the word Ghazwa. Nabi Muhammad never waged any Ghazwa against Hind. Hind is India. So uh, uh, this, this hadith about Ghazwatul Hind taking place sometime in the future, it seems to me to be invalid because you cannot have a Ghazwa after Nabi Muhammad has died. You have to rechange that language. The language is invalid. Um, next question. Dawood Pidcock, our brother, the famous British Muslim Dawood Pidcock, he founded the Islamic Party of Britain in 1990. It's now dissolved. And the question is, should Muslims participate in politics? And if so, to what extent? And should they do so in Britain? My answer is that unless and until you study the subject of Dajjal, you will not be able to understand the modern political system around the world. No. And nobody teaches the subject of Dajjal. The, apart from my learned brother, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf in the in United States, I'm the only other person who is lecturing on Dajjal. And yet there are some of those out there. There are people out there who are asking, why are you teaching Dajjal? Why are you teaching Dajjal? I don't know where they came from. I don't know what do they have in their head other than peanuts. Eh? 
<laughs> yes, why are you lecturing on Dajjal? They have objections to my teaching the subject of Dajjal. Well, then listen, you don't have to listen to me. There are many other, show, many other teachers out there. Go find somebody else if you don't mind. Allow me to do what the work I'm doing. When you study the subject of Dajjal, you'll be able to understand the modern age. You'll be, you'll be able to understand its politics. You'll understand the economy. You'll understand the monetary system. So many other things you'll understand about the modern world. Most important of all, you will understand modern Western civilization. Our Islamic eschatological explanation of modern Western civilization will astound you. So unless you have this knowledge, how can you take a decision as to whether or not you are permitted to participate in politics? My, I don't have the time now to do the, another lecture on this subject, but I do have an essay on my website, are Muslims permitted to participate in elections of the modern secular state? Do please search for that essay on my website, imranhussein.org. The brief answer is, it is the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad to participate in the political process in trying to change the direction of the movement of history, in trying to change your strategic environment. So he did engage in political activity. But the modern, West, the modern secular state is founded on the foundations of shirk. And if you are participating in the political system, you have to ensure that you do not enter into shirk. You will enter into shirk if you participate in electoral politics. Those who have more knowledge than me, let them do what they want. But if you, uh, if you have respect for my knowledge on the subject, then I say to you, no, I do not participate in electoral politics. And those who look to me as a teacher will refrain from participation in electoral politics of the modern secular state. And all around the world today, that's the kind of state you have. Uh, I, I, uh, Brother Dawood Pitcock has been in correspondence with me for the last few months. Uh, he was supposed to meet with me for the first time in early December in Manchester, but he fell ill. Uh, Brother Dawood, may Allah grant that you may recover from your illness. And I look forward to meeting with you again when next I visit Britain, inshallah. Next question, can you please explain if the Torah is a specific book or a collection of books? The Quran does not answer that question. The Quran simply informs us that there was a book called the Torah. And Nabi Muhammad Islam, asked the Jews to bring the Torah. So there was a Torah. And they brought the Torah. He then asked them, read from the Torah. What does your book say about the punishment for zina? And they put someone to read from the Torah. Abdullah bin Salam, who was the rabbi, had taken the shahad and become a Muslim. And he was standing beside the Prophet ﷺ while they were reciting from the Torah. So yes, there was a book called the Torah at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And we do not know today whether that book was divided into different sub-books as the present Torah is. You have the five books of Moses. So this is my answer to you. I can't go beyond that. Many critics argue that the methodology of going to the Quran first and then to the Hadith would lead to the development of new fiqh and ijtihad which will go against the four schools of thought which are established. What will be the response to this? Number one, correct methodology is to always go to the Quran first, regardless of what would be the consequence. You cannot bother about consequences when you're doing something which is right. It is the proper methodology. If you do not go to the Quran first, and study the Qur'an, then how would you know whether or not a hadith is fabricated? How would you know whether or not Nabi Muhammad 
really married a child. Yes, that's what the hadith says. He married a child, six years of age. But the strange thing is, the mis mysterious thing is, that all those who defend that methodology and accept that hadith, that Nabi Muhammad married a child who was six years of age, they, why do they not recognize that unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this is something specific to him and not to anybody else, then we have to accept that this is a sunnah. Yes. It is only Allah, not you. Only he who says this is specific for the Prophet. Nobody else. So the Allah never said that about this so-called marriage at the age of six. Yeah. So since Allah never said that, the hadith says he married a girl at the age of six. That's what the hadith said. So then it becomes a sunnah. Tell me I'm wrong. It becomes a sunnah to marry a six-year-old child. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, then why don't you marry a six-year-old? No one has married a six-year-old since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And you're going to tell me this is the correct methodology? I bring to you the correct methodology. If your methodology is wrong, come to the right methodology. And you'll see that that hadith is in conflict with the Quran. Yes, it's an insult to Prophet Muhammad ﷺ to say that he married a six-year-old child. An insult to him. Yes, that's right. So I am giving you the correct methodology. I didn't bring it. My teacher taught me. Mulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. And it is because I am using that proper methodology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to be able to explain so many verses of the Quran which were not properly explained before. Yes. So you do not bother about consequences when you're doing the right thing. Thing. What is the most important thing we can do to avoid the fitna of the jar? First of all, you've got to study the subject. How will you study the subject when your maulana goes on the mimbar week after week after week after week, but he'll never open his mouth to talk about the jar? So then how will you get the knowledge? Eh? And when you tell your maulana, go and st teach the subject, where will he teach it? Because he doesn't have the knowledge. And yet he's a Maulana. He's a great scholar. The answer, you have to look for those who are teaching the subject of Dajjal if you are to be able to respond to his fitna. That's the first thing you have to do. In addition to that, Nabi Muhammad said to recite the first ten ayat of Surah Al-Kahf for protection from the fitna of the job. In addition to that, there is a dua that you should memorize and recite this dua before you make the salams in your salat. Allahumma inni a'uzu bika min azab al-qabr wa min azab al-nar wa a'uzu bika min fitnat al-mahya wal-mamat wa min fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. It's not too difficult to memorize. Memorize this dua and recite it constantly. If true Christians are followers of Jesus and true Muslims are followers of Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon them both, is it okay for a Muslim to become a Christian and to follow Jesus? The Quran says, La ikraha fid deen. If Allah says there is no compulsion in deen, it means a person, a human being, has the freedom, accept, either accept the deen which has come from Allah or reject that deen. Yes, you have the freedom to do so. Secondly, if you are in the deen which has come from Allah, the deen of Islam, in this deen there are several ummah. There is the ummah of Muhammad Islam, in the deen of Islam. There's the Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam, in the Deen of Islam. There's the Ummah of Nabi Musa Islam, in the Deen of Islam. Okay? We, within the Deen of Islam, if someone wants to choose to move from one Ummah to another Ummah to another Ummah, that's his choice. It is when 
you do it in a manner which jeopardizes the security of the state, then that's an act of treason. And then there's a, there's a, a, a legal provision for responding to treason. Tre treason is debt in all laws. All laws, treason is debt. But I am not a scholar of law. And I prefer to let the scholars of law deal with the, the law of treason in Islam. But there is no prohibition against anyone changing their religion. If you want to leave Islam and go and worship a stone, you have the freedom to do so, but you'll pay the price for it. What is your opinion Will Israel expand its borders and conquer Saudi Arabia's oil fields outright? Israel doesn't have to do that. Israel already controls Saudi Arabia's oil fields, yes, by proxy. Saudi Arabia has been uh, betraying this ummah and betraying the religion of Islam from day one, from day one. And uh, when Nabi is when Imam al-Mahdi comes, the first thing that will happen when he proclaims himself to be the Mahdi, the first thing that will happen is that he'll be attacked from, with an army coming down from Sham. So as a result of this, we know that the insurrection in Syria is not going to end at all until that time. Yes, they're going to come to attack the Imam. And when they are coming to attack the Imam between Medina and Mecca, the, the earth will open and swallow that army. When that happens, then the next army comes from Arabia. And this is the army of the Quraysh, which will come to attack the Imam. The state of Saudi Arabia will still be existing up to that time. Oh, yes. Then the Prophet said, that the army of the Quraysh will call, be called the army of the Kalb. Kalb has two meanings. Kalb is either a dog or Kalb is the name of a tribe. Well, there is no Kalb today in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. So you know what, the, what our army is going to be. He's going to defeat that army. And when he defeats that army, <laughs> goodbye to Saudi Arabia the American Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will return to the garbage bin of history from where it emerged in the first place. That is what's going to happen when Imam al-Mahdi comes. So Saudi Arabia is today, I used to say that Saudi Arabia was a sister of Israel 20 years ago, but I was wrong. At that time, they were only cousins. Now they're really sisters, yeah. It is my belief that Hillary Clinton will succeed Trump as president. At this point, Israel will start to create a buffer zone by name, which is called Greater Israel. In order to achieve this, Israel may launch a nuclear missile at itself, creating a deception, which will be the start of the war, which includes dismantling Saudi Arabia. Do you agree? We know certainly that the Torah says that the Holy Land extends from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. This is false. That's not the Holy Land, but, but it's there in the Torah, whoever rewrote it. And the river of Egypt is the river Nile. And so this state of Israel will have to extend, ex, expand its frontiers to take the entire eastern delta of Egypt from the River Nile to the Red Sea. And it is because they have to wage this war on Egypt to expand the territory. That's why they needed NATO in Libya. But those fools with a capital F who allow themselves to be used as guinea pigs to wage the bogus jihad in Libya and are doing the same thing in Syria. Those fools with a capital F, they now have left Syria, Libya as a NATO state. So Egypt's goose is cooked. Yeah, Egypt's goose is cooked. So yes, Israel will have to attempt to expand. 
So there is going to be a greater Israel, an attempt to establish a greater Israel. And therefore, there is going to be a war with Egypt. We know this for certain. But insofar as Saudi Arabia is concerned, why the need for Saudi Arabia? You already have in Saudi Arabia a little Israel, the sister of Israel. So there is no need to wage war in Saudi Arabia. No. Next question. Will the calf and the fa and the ra be imprinted on Dajjal's head like a birthmark? Or be a symbol like the eye of Horus? Of course it's a symbol. That on the forehead of Dajjal will be written kaf fa ra the Antichrist, for those of you who are not Muslims, that the Prophet said that on the forehead of the Antichrist will be written kafir, disbeliever. Now, this is not to be understood literally. <laughs> no. When you see Dajjal in person in Jerusalem, you would not see this written on his forehead, no. This is symbolic language, that he is a kafir, meaning he stands for the rejection of the truth which has come from Allah. And all those who follow him will also become kuffar like him. That is the importance of it, yes. So it is important for us to study the subject of Dajjal because we could lose our religion. And instead of being a believer in Allah, you become a kafir and you die and you go in your grave and you get the surprise of your life. Yes. That's why it is so important to study the subject of Dajjal. Uh, what is the Islamic stance on having women as leaders in government? Is that from the Hadith or the Quran and how authentic is the Hadith? Number one, Allah says in the Quran <laughs> that he created the male and the female the way he created the night and the day indicating well bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa layli idha yaghsha wa nahari idha tajalla wa ma khalaqa dhakara wa unsa that the same way that allah created the night and the day so too did he create the male and the female meaning you are functionally different and now the next ayah confirms that in the you have been created with different functions. You are functionally different. So women are created by Allah to function as women. And men are created by Allah to function as men. The day is made for work. And so it is the function of the male to work, to maintain his wife or his wives and his children. It is not the function of women to have to work, to maintain themselves. No, this is what the function of men. But Dajjal comes along and says, no, women have the freedom to do everything that a man does. This is Dajjal's feminist revolution. And so a woman can become the uh, army commander-in-chief, yes, a woman can be a policeman, a woman can be a lawyer, a woman can be a judge, a woman can be this and that, and a woman can be the head of state. That is the job. And as a consequence of this new feminist philosophy, society around the world is collapsing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's chaos out there. Why, why, why should we change and fix your system which is collapsing? That's your system, that's your choice. We prefer to have men who live as men and women who live as women. But you wouldn't allow us to do that. No, you want all of us to become part of your godless melting pot and you, you oppress us. That's what you do. You oppress us. So our answer is no. Allah did not create men, women to rule over men. No. And if Benazir Bhutto has her different opinion about that and Khalil Azir and the others in Bangladesh, if they have the other opinion, fine, that's their views. Our view comes from the Quran that Allah has created men and women functionally different. Why don't Islamic scholars have conference and agree so that common people easily find guidance 
why don't scholars write? Is it not the duty of them then for the common people to benefit? I do a lot of writing. I have about 20, 28 books now. The last one is being written at this time, uh, Dajjal, the Quran, and the Jasad. I'm just putting the finishing touches now. And the one before that, Constantinople in the Quran, has just been printed in Malaysia. Uh, we're ready now to ship copies from Malaysia. So I'm doing, doing my work of, 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 of writing. So why do the, the scholars come together to bring agreement? Answer? The problems that we face in the world of Islamic scholarship today pertains to modern Western civilization. That's where the problem is. And you cannot understand modern Western civilization using the Quran if you use your methodology. You cannot do it. So they are living in the world today using a methodology for a previous age and they are incapable of understanding the reality of the world today. And when I come to teach, they close the doors of the masjid to me. What can I do to help you? No, it's not possible to bring the scholars together to have agreement so long as they're using their wrong methodology. So all that I can do is to offer you is what my dear teacher, Mola, have mercy on his soul, what he gave to me and I give to you, the proper methodology for studying the Quran and then for studying the Hadith and then you're able to understand the modern age which is the age of modern Western civilization. Um, what is the best course of action to take in order to secure one's children from the attack of Dajjal? How to avoid them becoming jasads? Is it at all possible to do so in the city? Oh, or is it futile? Is there an antidote, if not, if done later? Mm. Well, I like your question, yeah. Um, the hadith of Tamim Modari is that the Jal is enter, will enter every town and every city, but he doesn't mention villages. Um, my study of the subject of Dabbatul Art, um, and you will get it from my book, uh, Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwalul Zaman, in that book. But the new book, which I'm just finishing now, on Dajjal, the Quran, and the Jasad, I'm going to expand on Dabbatul Art, or the creature of the earth. That Dajjal is using Dabbatul Art as a formidable weapon in order to transform all of mankind into jasads like himself. No, most people are not going to understand what is he talking about when he talks about a jasad. Why? Because your Maulana out there sitting on the mimbar never teaches the subject. No. So how will you know? He talks about everything else, but he never talks on the subject. So how will you know what's a jasad? Okay. Um, I can't give another lecture on the subject on the jasad. Uh, but my book, which I'm now writing, which is almost finished, uh, it will soon be on my website, inshallah. Uh, a jasad is a, a body without a soul. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm X used to refer to them as the, the house slave. They are externally a slave and internally a slave. Different from the field slave. He's externally a slave, but he has his internal freedom. But Dajjal wants to re pro reduce all of mankind to house slaves. That's the jasad he wants. And he starts with our children. The best protection for your children, number one, is to get them to recite the Quran every day in Arabic. How many times must I repeat that? Why does it go through one ear and come out the other ear? What am I supposed to do? I tell you once, I tell you twice, I tell you three times. How many times must I repeat it? Why? Allah did not send me in this world to keep on repeating a hundred thousand times to people who don't want to listen. Yeah? Better to spend my time to those who want to listen. Yes. So tell... Teach your children to recite the Quran 
in Arabic every day. The best time to recite the Quran is in the mornings. And they must recite the Quran in this way that you start at the beginning and you go all the way until you reach the end. Does your Maulana teach you that? Does he ever tell you that? And yet he's a big Maulana. Teach your children to recite the Quran from, more, from beginning to end. And when you finish, you start again. And when you finish, you start again. And when you finish, you start again. Why don't you tell your Maulana to teach the people this? And what's wrong with them? When you constantly, constantly recite the Quran, you finish the Quran at least once a month. This recitation of the Quran has shifa in it, healing. And it helps to heal the damage being done by the electromagnetic waves which Dajjal is inundating the world with at this time. From your, your smartphones and your wireless computers and your laptops and your, all these things. This, this, this electromagnetic waves already is preventing the bees from navigating to be able to make honey. If, that, if you're doing that to the bees, you can imagine what it's doing to your children. So this is the first response, we say. Recite the Quran for protection from the child. To protect the child's memory. Because once you lose your memory, you cannot think anymore. That's what the child wants to do, reduce you to a jasad. Yesterday, I met with a nine-year-old child. She was nine years of age. I said, let me test her memory. I said, here are the first, the names of the first five surahs of the Quran. I repeated it for her several times. I said, now go, walk, come back. Try to remember, recite for me. She could give me number one, she could give me number two. She had difficulty with number three after that, she couldn't remember. No, couldn't remember. No matter how long I tried with her, she could not remember these five because her memory was already damaged. This is what you have to do. Um, in addition, you should show, try to show, ensure that they don't use shoes with a rubber sole. Uh, the rubber sole pre prevents the electromagnetic waves in the body from being grounded into the earth. If you walk barefooted, better. If you have to wear a shoe with a leather sole, it'll go down. And also in Salat, in Salat, when you make Sijda, if you make Sijda in the proper way, then seven bones of the body will be grounded. Seven. The head, the forehead, and the nose is, is combined as one, one bone. And then your two hands, your two knees, and your two feet. So seven bones of the body are grounded into the earth, so the electromagnetic waves are going to be seeping down. And Dr. Ibrahim Kazim, Rahim of Allah, may Allah have mercy on his soul, did important research on this subject. Protect, how do we protect internal freedom? If you want to protect the internal freedom that Allah gave to you, you have to maintain your integrity. How do you maintain integrity? Allah gave to this mission, to this ummah, a mission. You are a Muslim. Do you, know, do you want to know what Allah asks you to do? Listen to what the Quran says. Allah has asked of you as a Muslim, Amar bil ma'aruf wa nahi anil munkar. Meaning, if it is right, stand up for it, regardless of the price you have to pay. You say, no, I can't do that. If I do that, my business will collapse. Yes. If I do that, they're going to say I'm a terrorist. If I do that, they put my name on a no-fly list. I won't be able to fly up to Miami. So how can I do that? You lost your integrity. That's right. When you lose your internal freedom and integrity, you're becoming a jasad. And Allah says, Nahi anil munkar. If it's wrong, if it's a lie, like 9-11, if it is something unjust and oppressive, stand up against it. If the government comes with this bogus law that the girl cannot be married until she's 18, why is it that the only voice in Trinidad and Tobago 
who stood up powerfully against this rubbish was Satnarain Maharaj, the, the Secretary General of the Hindu Mahasara. He was the only powerful voice in this country that stood up. Only Sat Maharaj, nobody else. So where is the integrity of the Muslims? You, you give a response like a watered down, diluted thing? No, stand up powerfully and speak. If it is wrong, if it is unjust, stand up against it. That is integrity. If you live like that, you will maintain your internal freedom. Next question. Since Jesus is the Messiah, and he was sent only to the Israelites, and Dajjal's mission is to impersonate the true Messiah, is Dajjal a trial only for the Jews? Should non-Jews not be concerned by Dajjal or only with Gog and Magog? No, no. The Prophet has told us that Dajjal represents the greatest fitna that all of mankind, not just the Jews, will experience. From the time of Adam Islam to the last day, there will be no greater trial for all of mankind than the trial of Dajjal. Will the true followers of Jesus accept Muhammad as the last prophet? When Jesus returns, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, then every Christian and every Jew in the world will have to accept that the Quran is the word of the one God. Everything in the Quran, they'll have to believe in it when he comes back. How can we convince our family to see the deception of the world today? There are those whose hearts Allah has sealed. So you can, you can warn them and tell them and they'll never accept what you say because Allah has sealed their hearts. But others whose hearts have not been sealed, you keep on trying. But you must always try with wisdom and in a gentle way to try to get them to understand. The answers are located in the Quran, not in CNN, not in your nightly news. So if you want to explain, if you want to convince, you have to take them to the Quran. In your opinion, what would be the route that would allow access to this knowledge that supersedes the knowledge of the scientific and industrial revolution that emerged from modern Western civilization. It is only, it is only with the Quran, nothing else, only the Quran can explain to you these revolutions which brought modern Western civilization into being, the scientific and technological revolution is still continuing to this day. The industrial revolution is still continuing. The feminist revolution is still continuing. All of these revolutions emerge from modern Western civilization. And you cannot understand modern Western civilization without the Quran. But you cannot understand the Quran, or what it has to say about modern Western civilization, unless you have the capacity to think and unless you use proper methodology. That is what we got from my teacher, Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. If today the Mawlanas are at sea, yes, that's where they, they are at sea, the world of Islamic scholarship at sea. The reason for this is because they're not studying the Quran properly. That's why. They do not have the proper methodology for studying the Quran and they're afraid to think. That's what they're doing. May Allah grant that they may wake up. Are they going to use gene, DNA technology to create just us? No, I don't think so. They don't need it. All they need is a smartphone and the wireless and uh, the television sets and they'll be able to transform. They've done it in the United States already. The United States is filled with jasad already. I thought it was only the United States until I realized my own world of Islam also has so many jasads, people who have eyes and yet cannot see. A jasad, people who have ears and yet cannot hear. A jasad, people who have hearts and yet cannot
cannot understand, or they don't want to understand, are just as. These are the people who still can't recognize, cannot recognize, that the money you have in your pocket is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram. And if they can't recognize that, what can you do for them? Leave them and move on with those who want to think. Where is the Dajjal at this time? He was chained in a monastery in Britain. And where is he at this time? The Hadith of Tamim al-Dari, excuse me. The Hadith of Tamim al-Dari informed us that the Dajjal was in chains uh, on an island. And the island was one month's journey from the Arab world by sea. And uh, in this island there is a jasad, uh, sorry, a jasasa, which is a spy, so an island with expertise in spying, espionage. And that uh, in this island the monastery was lying in ruins, meaning that the religious way of life, the Christian way of life, uh, is going to collapse. It's going to be an island of atheists etc. And when he's released, it is from this island that he will launch his mission to eventually rule the world from Jerusalem. So this island must show an obsession with the Holy Land. And I came to the conclusion that the island was Britain. I did so in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, which was written in 2001. Um, uh, since I wrote that book, the only objections have been from those who say, but the Prophet said that the Dajjal will come from the East and Britain is in the West, so therefore you're wrong. Well, tell them, go back and do your homework. I don't need to spend, spend every time, every time explaining this subject. Go back and do your homework. Well, uh, the Quran tells us about, in Surah Al-Mursalat, a shadow we shall come upon the well. And the Quran speaks of the shadow having three parts. And we say, this is my uh, interpretation of the Quran. And of course, whenever anyone interprets the Quran or the Hadith, only Allah can confirm that it is correct. So we must say Allah knows best. And that's what I do. Uh, that in uh, the first part of the shadow, we had Pax Britannica, where Britain ruled the world. But in the second part, we had Pax Americana, so Dajjal has moved his headquarters from Britain to the United States. He's no longer he headquarters in Britain. Um, and then in the third part of the shadow, Pax Americana will also disappear and be replaced. And we say that we consider the third to be Pax Judaica, that Israel will now try to become the ruling state in the world. So this is where we are at this time. We are in the process now of transition from second stage to third stage. That Pax Americana is in the decline and we are on our way to Pax Judaica, which is the next question. Have we already passed from Pax Americana to Pax Judaica? No, we are in the process. I come to this conclusion because in order for the transition from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana to take place, you had to have two world wars, the First World War and the Second World War, where 20 million people were killed in order for the transition to take place. Therefore, I say, for the transition from Pax Americana to Pax Judaica to take place, their plan is for the Great War which is the great nuclear war. And uh, when this great nuclear war takes place, uh, they expect that modern Western civilization will be destroyed. That's what they want, because they consider modern Western civilization to really fulfill its function supporting Israel. They don't need it anymore. It's more of a liability now than an asset. If you look at what the 
gilets jaunes in France are doing. Gilets jaunes, the yellow vests, huh? they are rocking the state, rocking the state. So modern Western civilization is showing signs that people can emerge who can challenge the elite, and they don't want that. So the implication is that they want the Great War so that they can get rid of modern Western civilization, so it would not stand in the way of Israel. They're also hoping that the Great War would destroy Russia and China, but that's not going to happen. Does France, terrorism, and uh, Muslim attacks have any meaning with the Dajjal's plan? The plan of the Dajjal is to wage war, number one, on Muslims, and wage war, number two, on the Orthodox Christians. So they make Muslims look bad, make Islam look bad, and make Russia look bad. That's what they're doing. Because these are the two most powerful obstacles standing in the way of Israel. Um, last question before we stop today's session, and we'll continue next week. The legal person is a form of an idol which has been created by the modern system of governance. Would you say that this is the type of entity that you speak? I, sorry, I can't answer this question. What will be the state of Mecca and Medina and of its people during the post Melhammer period? And is it a good place for Hydra? Mecca and Medina, our prophet has said that Jal will not be able to enter. So you have safety in Mecca and Medina. Um, and the jar and plague, the epidemics cannot enter Mecca and Medina. But the important thing to note is that so long as the state of Saudi Arabia exists, you do not have freedom. You do not have freedom. Even in Mecca and Medina, you do not have freedom. The most important thing for a Muslim is to maintain his freedom, to stand up for what is right and stand up against what is wrong. And if you cannot do that in Saudi Arabia, then get out of Saudi Arabia. If you can't do that in the United States, get out of the United States. Go wherever on Allah's earth is. You have the freedom to stand up for what is right and stand up against what is wrong. That is where a Muslim should live. All right, this is enough for today's, um, today's session. Remember what we're doing, we've been answering. Look at the amount left. <laughs> we've been answering uh, questions which were posed in the seminar in um, Birmingham. Before we end, somebody sent me the card in, in Birmingham, in the seminar, and a lovely, lovely message. Let me read it out. It makes me so happy to get this. Uh, uh, from a sister, from, and she's in Luton, outside of London. A heartfelt salam alaikum to the best sheikh in the world. I pray that this message finds you well. I've been watching your lectures for the last few years now, alhamdulillah. And you are truly are from one of his best. Allah has gifted you with immense knowledge and a voice that touches so many hearts. You have enlightened countless hearts and you have made an incredible difference to so many people, subhanAllah. No one ever has explained Dajjal and Akhir Zaman in such a clear and detailed way in which you have. You have truly made a significant difference in my life and my family's life. May Allah always bless you with his countless blessings and keep you in good health. I mean, so that you may continue to sp spread the message of Islam in a way that no one else has ever done. I mean, I pray that Allah accepts your lifelong dedication and continued hard work for Islam and may he make us and raise us from his righteous people. MashaAllah. I pray that you will continue to visit Britain, inshallah, and will be highly honored if you can visit my home. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Well, these kind of messages <laughs> makes it, makes it uh, easy for me, alhamdulillah, to carry on my work. May Allah um, make it easy for me to continue. Next week, inshallah, we'll continue answering the questions. Wassalamu alaikum. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.